Um, so welcome to the overview of Argonaut Initiatives. Uh, it's great to have you. I hope the uh, developer conference has been going well for you. Um, I will be uh, your guide through this. Uh, just a, a little bit of background of me, and then we'll jump in. Uh, I'm an independent consultant uh, with Wave One. Uh, my background comes from uh, EHR uh, development implementation and interface and integration team of a large EHR vendor. Uh, but I've been involved for a long time in standards development uh, with Consolidated CDA for those of you who still get to do document exchange like I do. Uh, but also more recently spent a lot of time uh, in the development of Fire, uh, both with the uh, Argonaut project and uh, the development of the US core profiles that um, were balloted and published through HL7 as an official uh, standard. So uh, the, the course today, we're going to kind of walk through the various Argonaut initiatives. Uh, Argonaut formed a few years back. Uh, we've actually run several different initiatives. Um, I'm sure some of them you've heard of, uh, many of them maybe not. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, where we're headed uh, for 2018. Um, so uh, great to have you here. Um, but before we do that, uh, I think a lot of folks have heard, you know, the Argonaut project and, and maybe don't even know exactly what we are. Um, and just to really start with, when you think of the Argonaut project, I think it's, it's very important to think of us as an implementation community. Uh, we, you know, we're not a standards body. Uh, we weren't formed to create brand new standards. Uh, for that, we look to HL7. HL7 has a very robust process. How many folks have participated in the HL7 ballot process? Okay, a few folks. Uh, the, the idea of you publish a standard, there's a 30-day comment period, and then you have to review and go through everyone's comments line by line. It's a, it's a lot of work, and it takes a, a bunch of time. And the Argonauts had, uh, you know, a lot of them participate in HL7, but a part of the uh, community around Argonaut was we need to move a little bit faster. We need to do some testing first before handing it over uh, to a standards body. So the first thing is we're not a standards body. Uh, the other thing is we're not a private kind of separate organization. We actually are kind of underneath the HL7 umbrella. Uh, we kind of partner with them. Um, and we're open to, to all participants. Um, so in terms of priority setting, the priorities are set by folks who kind of put money in to support uh, the project. Uh, but, but ultimately, once an initiative's up and running, we welcome all participation. Um, so it's important to note there is private funding behind Argonaut to support the implementation community. Uh, but once an initiative's up and running, uh, you know, we, we, we welcome participation from all, all sizes and, and shapes uh, of organizations. Um, so who, kind of who are the organizations behind it? Um, you know, if this is a, you know, I look at this list, and these are the folks who did some of the initial funding, and a few folks were added once we got running, up and running. Uh, it's really not fair. I mean, it's fair to list these folks because they provided money. Um, but <laughs> there are several other organizations that I would say are, you know, really key participants who, who weren't part of the founding, who just participate and provide feedback into kind of this implementation community. Um, and so uh, we don't list them all, but, uh, and I won't mention any specifically, but there are at least, a, you know, 10 more organizations I can think of that would, I would say, really contributed strongly to, to our community. But these are kind of the founders, the initial folks. Um, in terms of staff, I think it's interesting to see, you know, the Argonaut name splashed around. Uh, it's, a, it's a very limited number of folks. Uh, you know, Josh Mandel and Graham Grieve have been involved. Uh, Eric Haas is in the room who's been involved. Uh, myself, in terms of kind of helping develop some of the specifications. Uh, and then project management support provided by Mickey Trapathy and Jennifer Monahan. So it's a, it's a very small group, and it's not really fair to think of it as just this group, because we're kind of coordinating kind of the larger body of, uh, you know, the, the large EHR vendors, the Cerners, the Epics, Athena, all scripts, you know, a whole, whole bunch of folks participating uh, in, this, in this effort. Um, so where did we start? Uh, uh, actually, so I think for folks who were at uh, John Holomka's kind of opening keynote yesterday, uh, and I, how many folks actually had heard of the JSON report before? Okay, all right. So I don't have to talk about how how awful healthcare software is, and um, you know how bad we are. Um, but it was you know as a result of that, there was a task force formed and some acknowledgement of hey, you know we need to think about how we provide open API access and, and how how you know wh what are we going to do about this? And so uh, that really triggered uh, the formation of the Argonaut project at the end of December. Um, and, you know, we talk about, you know, jumping in this API certification requirements that ONC provided, but really, the beginning of January 2015, we had a very small project, which was uh, CCDA is, you know, uh, the, the dot, one of the kind of primary uh, document exchange content vehicles uh, in the United States. And the question was, is, hey, we have all this content in CCDA, it's, you know, it's a thousand page specification. How good is the coverage of FHIR? Does, would FHIR support all the data elements that are in CCDA? So the very first Argonaut project was a, a team of folks went through the entire consolidated CDA spec, 
Oh, I shouldn't say the entire, the key elements, there's, there's some stuff in there that no one ever has used, um, to say, like, uh, you know, does Fire have coverage for these particular elements? You know, we have all these elements for problems, like how does that look in the condition resource allergies? How does that look in the allergy intolerance resource? Uh, and provided some feedback directly into the Fire ballot that was existing at that time to say, all right, here's a few things you should add, here's a few things that you should consider. So that was actually the very first project that we don't talk too much about. Uh, but ultimately in 2015, um, ONC, had a kind of, uh, I don't remember at that point if it was draft or final rule that uh, required uh, open API access as part of their certification requirement. Um, how many folks, did, do folks, did that certification requirement require FHIR or what did folks, folks remember? Was, how many things said it required FHIR? Did not require FHIR, that's right. So it's just provide API access and a lot of vendors have used FHIR, not all of them, but um, that was kind of the initial, uh, you know, big driver uh, for folks to, uh, well, one of the drivers, I shouldn't say the, definitely not the only driver. Um, so shortly after that, you know, in parallel, there were some other projects going on. It's important to note, uh, there was a project called the Data Access Framework, or called DAF, um, and uh, the Argonauts looked to DAF as kind of the initial place to pilot and do some testing. Uh, DAF had a whole set of profiles in it, um, and in kind of standards world, we, we added a lot of requirements in DAF. So, uh, the condition resource, you know, we had probably a dozen elements we expected vendors to implement. We had like multiple birth indicator, we had all kinds of things. And the Argonauts did an initial sprint on this and said, whoa, 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 this is, this is uh, more than our systems capture. This is kind of an unreasonable amount of requests, you know, of, of uh, data elements that we just don't have. And uh, maybe we'll have them in the future and that's great, but let's, let's kind of scope it to the reasonable set, the baseline of what we expect to do. Um, and so ultimately the data access framework uh, guide was kind of scoped down, and we produced our uh, Argonaut uh, query uh, implementation guide uh, in, and published in, in December. Um, there's a provider directory implementation guide, which I'll talk a little bit about, and then uh, we have scheduling and support for CDSOOCs and several of the other initiatives, which I'll, I'll march right through here in a minute. Uh, the cool thing about Argonaut is it was, you know, four short years from inception to market adoption. Uh, Care Quality uh, is an initiative in industry that connects networks to other networks. Uh, they participate in the provider directory uh, sprints and development of that guide and have uh, produced a provider directory that provides access by fire. Uh, Commonwealth is an actual network uh, in the U.S. connecting many vendors. Um, they've built in some uh, fire exchange and, uh, on document reference. Um, and really the big thing is, you know, over half of the uh, 100 plus certified EHRs have used Fire as their way to provide that uh, open API access. And of course, I know, you know, many folks have seen the Apple announcements, but, uh, you know, and, and the use of the Argonaut implementation guide. And even when I write that, you know, we write this slide of, you know, four short years. Four, sh four years still seems like a long time to me, but in standards world that, you know, something's actually been developed and produced and actually implemented in production, uh, it's less than four years. And by standards, you know, speed, that's, that's incredible. Uh, and so it's something to be excited and, you know, some look around the room, there are some faces who participate in this and, and it's a big deal. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, marching through some of the prior Argonaut initiatives and, and where we landed. Uh, and uh, then we'll talk about where we're going at the end. Um, so the very first one uh, is, is SMART. Um, so SMART is a separate, I should be very careful, SMART is a separate organization. Uh, and they are all, you know, very committed to uh, substitutable healthcare applications, how you plug into various EHR or other applications. Uh, and one of their projects was uh, Smart on Fire. Um, how do you provide secure access uh, into an EHR? Uh, and as part of that, some of the Argonauts had done some work on it, and so uh, there was consensus to say, hey, this is a great thing that we should accelerate and we should all support. Uh, and so kind of the key outcome of this was um, a set of kind of profiles that were gonna be supported and a actual formal security risk assessment. So they had an outside person come through and, and go through it and say, okay, you know, this approach looks good and uh, we'll go forward, uh, go forward with it. Um, and so that was the, really the, you know, after the CCDA on fire, this was the kind of CCDA, sorry, comparison to fire. Uh, this was the, the really kind of first uh, or kind of second official project. The one Argonaut is best known for, of course, is the data query and document query profiles. Uh, this initially started uh, in uh, 2015, and it's, it's interesting in that um, it really started just as a series of sprints of, you know, could we just look at the fire specification and get consistency across vendors, just looking at existing standards out there, and that was the DAF standard. 
Uh, and we learned quickly that, you know, we can do pretty good, but um, we really need to do a little bit more formalization into our own guide. Uh, it's important that we do, uh, you know, bring, it, bring a bunch of clients in and do testing, but we really kind of zoomed in on these four use cases, you know, patient using an approved web app or, or mobile app, and then clinician uh, doing uh, the same thing. Um, this guide, when we published, uh, was all built on DSU2 and is still on DSU2 today. Uh, I think that's one of the things that uh, we talk a lot about is DSU2 is a very sticky version uh, in that uh, it was, uh, it's, it's, and it's, you know, in terms of vendor transition to SDU3 and R4, uh, we'll see. I do see some vendors working to SDU3, uh, but, you know, R4 hasn't published yet, and uh, we'll, we'll see when that time comes. The other, the, you know, the outcomes of this particular uh, specification, um, you know, there's a published guide, uh, a document reference profile, um, must guidance on must support, uh, which is a funny concept in the FHIR specification that if you write an implementation guide, you can define what must support means. Uh, and so if you dig in our spec, you'll see it's, uh, you know, if you have it, please send it. If you don't, it's okay. But really, if we give you test data and you don't send it, you know, you're not conformant. But it's a, it's a little bit of this gray area. And also kind of free text units. There's a lot of uh, FHIR focuses on how do you send coded data. And we tried to give some guidance on, hey, if the lab sends you a uh, uncoded uh, uh, you come reference range, like what do you do with it? Um, and to give guidance on how to, how to send that information. Um, and I think another big part of the, you know, the data query document query guide that Argonaut led to, which we'll talk about in more detail, is something called US Fire Core. How many folks had heard of US Core before? Okay, all right, that's really good. Um, I, it's, folks often ask, hey, what's the relationship between US Core and the Argonaut guide? And it's, it's important to note US Core is just an SDU3 version of the Argonaut requirements, okay? So we took everything that was in the DSTU2 Argonaut guide and we upgraded it to Fire SDU3 um, and ran it through a ballot at HL7. And part of that was uh, there was this existing project going on at HL7 and, and uh, we had the opportunity to ballot it and you never know with our um, the government regulations in the US, whether they can point to something like Argonaut, which is unofficial, or they need a standard like a US Core. But it, you know, it's important to note that uh, the differences are primarily just between version is, versions, not necessarily. We try not to introduce any uh, new requirements. Uh, in terms of what that means for the Argonauts, uh, we've talked internally about whether we'd write our own SDU3 guide. And the reality is we don't need to, because we're just encouraging all participants to use uh, the US Core guide. Um, and kind of the future of US Core and Argonaut, as we do our kind of pilot work, as you look at the future projects at the end of this presentation, uh, a lot of our pilot work is being done on SDU3, kind of, you know, questionnaire, questionnaire response, clinical notes, you know, those are kind of on, you know, kind of pilot guides. But ultimately, we're optimistic that when US Core goes to future ballots at HL7, we'll kind of have this process where Argonaut does kind of some of the pilot work, we do some testing, we flesh out requirements, and then ultimately in terms of HL7, we try to roll that into US Core. So we haven't done that a bunch, but the idea is there's still benefit to the standards process. I think, you know, a lot of folks, it's, there's, there's a lot of benefit to testing and playing and kind of trying to figure out that sweet spot, but then the kind of, this, the, the kind of more formal march through with a comment review period, we've seen very beneficial and uh, new things have come out uh, as part of that process. Um, so that's the data query, document query, and, and the US Core. The other big project uh, was, gosh, 2016, hard to believe it was two years ago, uh, was uh, provider directory. Uh, provider, how many folks have done work on provider directories? Are there, okay, a few less folks. Wow, I, you know, I, I thought this is gonna be really easy, right? We're trying to look up a provider, maybe a specialty or a location, um, piece of cake. Uh, well, it, it's interesting. Um, there's use cases where you have a provider who's a neonatal oncologist at one site and then just an oncologist, you know, have kind of different specialties depending on uh, the particular location or organization they're working with. Uh, and so you, how, how you track that role across the different organizations uh, is fairly, uh, fairly tricky. And then, uh, and then, you know, what do you actually want to query for when looking up providers? Uh, we very quickly learned that uh, data quality and, and how you load a provider directory and how you maintain, uh, you know, good information there is beyond what the Argonauts could tackle. Um, it's still something that in industry, I think we're, uh, you know, 
probably need some outside help, and there's some other kind of governance projects that um, may pick that up. But we really zoomed into kind of the technology side of, all right, what do I want to query for? Uh, what are the relationships between different resources? Um, and as part of this project, uh, for I don't know, for better or worse, the practitioner role in Fire used to have kind of the role piece kind of coded within it. So, you, you know, the provider specialty and type and a whole bunch of information. And that got pulled out into a separate resource during this project. So you have the practitioner, which describes the person, and then you have the practitioner role and the different roles. Uh, you know, you have multiple roles for the, the different roles they can play at different institutions. Uh, so that was one part of that. And uh, in terms of the kind of outcomes, there is a guide that was published. Care Quality uh, picked up that guide. There was uh, Michigan Health Information Network participated and provided lots of good feedback. Um, just to give folks a taste of the kind of the final use cases that kind of came out of this project, um, you know, search by demographics, uh, search within a region, uh, you know, city or state. Uh, um, you know, these are the types of things uh, we spent a lot of time working through. Um, I consider Provider Directory one of those projects that, you know, we move the ball forward, uh, but in terms of, like, how much work uh, is needed to have, like, a true kind of Provider Directory, there's, there's still a fair bit of work uh, uh, to be done. Uh, the next project, I'll let Eric Haas talk about patient provider scheduling. I, you know, the argument, there's only a few of us, and I thought, well, might as well let Eric talk about the project he ran. Okay, there'll be a quiz afterwards, too. So, um, so with patient and provider scheduling, um, we ran that project last year, and like Brett, I thought scheduling, how hard can it be, right? Because, you know, Zoc, I tried out ZocDoc. That looked pretty easy. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm one of the only veterinarians you ever see in fire, but um, I have a book. You just write a name in, you know, you call up, write a name. But it turns out to be a little more complicated, and so what we did here is we had a... Uh, created a, a scheduling project that where we um, kind of defined some use cases and kind of uh, shrunk it down a bit and and created some guidance for accessing or basically uh, ask, uh, finding available appointments and being able to book those appointments. Um, and again, the specification is ver uh, based on uh, version 3. Um, and um, I have a presentation tomorrow morning that goes over in greater depth. So if you're interested in scheduling, I'm going to have our, our Argonaut, I'm going to go over the Argonaut scheduling guide tomorrow. Um, and some of our outcomes he listed here, um, uh, we have a published implementation guide, and, and there's the, uh, the, the URL for that. And, and what we did is, in our use cases, we kind of shrunk down, like I said, we shrunk it down a bit because it, it's a big topic. And we kind of centered our, our, uh, all the, all the um, workflow around operations that we, we created um, for finding available appointments. And so we had a couple of use cases briefly. We talk about a provider-based scheduling. We talk about patient-based scheduling, including using third-party apps. So we have this idea of finding available appointments. We also have uh, introduced a publication, a PubSub model, where the application will do all the work, but they need to have the slots being continuously updated and, and given to them. So again, if you're interested, uh, more information on this in my talk tomorrow. Thanks, Eric. Uh, it's funny to talk about, you know, you mentioned PubSub, and I think we didn't have a lot of folks implement subscriptions um, and, you know, brought, you know, beyond just scheduling kind of subscription support and fire. And, and I think I've had three people come up to me uh, in the last two days saying, hey, what are, you, what are you doing for Argonaut subscriptions? Like, could you, could you make that a project? Uh, and uh, I don't, you know, we, we have our project set for 20, or well, <laughs> things can change, but we have a project set for 2018, but I do think there's a lot of benefit, and you never know that that could be a, a future project that we, if there's enough interest within the Argonaut community uh, to push that one forward. Okay, uh, CDS hooks. Uh, this is a, you know, you, you kind of hear us bounce a little bit where there's kind of already a community effort that Argonauts have plugged into and accelerate, and sometimes we kind of roll our own. Um, so CDS Hooks actually was a, you know, it's a vendor agnostic remote decision support specification. Uh, it was a group that had already been up and running. Um, so uh, Kevin Shackleton from Cerner, Isaac Vetter from Epic had done a ton, well, I shouldn't just name them, but there's a, <laughs> Bryn Rhodes, there's a whole bunch of folks um, who have supported the development uh, of this uh, specification. Um, and uh, the, uh, it had made some progress. Uh, at, in terms of HL7, they had actually joined and uh, participated in a few of the connectathons there. It's the, the largest track at HL7. There are 30 plus folks who participated. Uh, and the, you know, the Argonaut, kind of our role uh, on this particular project uh, was a little bit of rigor in terms of project management and calls, but also hosting a series of sprints where we marched through and said, all right, 
we're going to line up all the CDS hooks providers, we're going to line up all the EHR vendors, and we're going to walk through, like, what do you actually support? What are the steps you had to go through to develop uh, your particular uh, application? Um, and just so folks see a little visual of CDS hooks, I know there's a talk going on in CDS hooks, it's, uh, which maybe some of you have seen before. Um, but the basic workflow, in this case, the hook I chose was um, medication order. So you're directly in your EHR uh, within the workflow. Uh, triggers the CDS hook to remote uh, service. Uh, in some cases, the context is sent uh, directly over. The, sorry, the information is sent directly over to the CDS service, so they can they can run their their algorithm. In other cases, the CDS service kind of calls back and pulls in the information they need. Uh, and then ultimately, one of the three cards are returned: of an information card, a suggestion card, uh, or a smart app link. Uh, and the smart app link, um, you know, can actually launch this. You know, provide the, the link to to launch the smart app and and you know do direct interaction uh, with that smart app to close out. Um, so CDS hooks uh, has had. Uh, let me just look here. So CDS hooks 1.0 is in draft. Uh, it was a specification that we actually agreed uh, through. A, bunch of debate that should go to bow to HL7. Um, so it was in the process of becoming a formal standard. Uh, optimistic, that'll be, I shouldn't say optimistic. We're, we're going to get it published uh, later this summer. Uh, so uh, hold us hold us to that. Um, but uh, in within the specification, uh, the 1.0 is the actual kind of formal part of the specification. Uh, but if you're brand new to CDS hooks, I'd encourage you to take a peek at the quick start guide. And I actually think I may have had that pulled up here, um, just to give you a taste of what is in here. Um, so within here, you know, it kind of talks through, like, if you're going to build, if you're brand new to building a CDS service, here, you know, obviously you need to have a, uh, you know, re robust uh, method for the, you know, what, what decision are you trying to make? But in terms of actually connecting uh, with an EHR, uh, there's kind of the steps uh, to work through. And ultimately, one of the things that has been really uh, enlightening to me is, and I suppose for many of you, is is maybe obvious, is the importance of a sandbox. Um, and I don't know why I still chuckle at this, but the sandbox has a few hooks in here, patient view uh, uh, and you know a medication order. And what's cool about this sandbox, um, and I think I actually have this up to, I won't play with this too much, but uh, the ability to actually configure, if you want to configure your own, like change the fire server on the back end, or if you want to test uh, with your CDS service, uh, that's all available uh, through the sandbox. Uh, one uh, funny thing, uh, what did we, hmm. we had a scenario once where the specification said one thing and the sandbox did another thing. What do you think all the developers uh, wrote to? <laughs> sandbox. So the lesson there was uh, keep the sandbox up to date, all right? Um, so we've, uh, we've made some changes, it's, it's currently, you know, it's up to date now, uh, but uh, yeah, that's a lesson for all of us who are doing standards development that the uh, sandbox is more important than whatever we write. Um, okay, so... All right, so priorities for 2018. Uh, it was, I guess, December we kind of formed the project sponsors, and, uh, you know, it's always interesting as we wrap up, you know, we wrapped up... Uh, uh, provider directory and scheduling and CDS hooks. I guess CDS hooks, we were kind of in the wrap-up phase in terms of Argonaut effort. And we said, hey, what do you want to work on? And you don't know if the vendors are going to come, you know, the participants are going to say, oh, we, you know, this Argonaut thing was good. We're, we're ready to take a break or where we are. And uh, we got a lot of suggestions of what the vendors were being asked to their customers. And so we talked about new fire profiles, tackling some administration, you know, administrative use cases. Um, you know, there, of course, the DaVinci project had spun up. Um, you know, additional app integration guidance. Uh, you know, folks had interest in, you know, different kind of login approaches. Um, and then maybe just support for some of our prior initiatives. We've had some success. Let's, let's keep working, uh, working on those. Uh, and ultimately what we settled on for uh, 2018 are, are three different projects. Uh, the first is clinical notes. Uh, how many folks have looked in the FHIR specification for how you exchange clinical notes? Okay. It's interesting when you talk to clinicians, it's one of the, at least my experience is, uh, it's one of the most asked for data elements of, hey, how do I, you know, clinical notes are extremely valuable for transitions of care and communication uh, between providers, between people. Uh, and so kind of one of our jokes for a long time was, hey, we have the common clinical data set courtesy of ONC, why don't we make up a common clinical notes set? Uh, so we did do that. Uh, 
And you know, it was you know we looked at the VA's work, uh, Epic, Cerner, other Meditech folks who contributed what they saw as common notes, and, and we have a pretty good set we're starting with. It's shrunk a little bit, um, but part of that is uh, there was a CDA uh, document exchange effort to include notes too, and you know that's also often running separate from Argonaut to exchange notes. Uh, bulk data access, um, you know, how do you you know get a, a large uh, dump of patients and uh, there's been a lot of work already done in bulk data. Some of this actually started a year ago in uh, last summer. Gosh, yeah, a year ago. Last summer in SMART, um, and that one project kind of had a running start going into the year. And then the last one is simple assessment questionnaires. I think the key part here uh, is simple assessment. Uh, what we've found is uh, questionnaires can be very complex. Uh, you know, you ask one question, and you can, it could, uh, dictate what the next question is and, and how that works out. And uh, so we're trying to start with very simple questionnaires and uh, we are, we're doing our best, but we're often running here. So, so these are our priorities in terms of folks to contact. Uh, Josh and Dan are actually both here working on back end. I think there's a presentation on that uh, today. Uh, clinical notes, myself and Eric and questionnaire response, you know, we both kind of support each other, but kind of flip the roles in terms of who's primary. Just in terms of really quick timelines, I think it's helpful to know where we are and your ability to, to kind of help shape these projects. Uh, bulk data started kind of last summer and you know meeting with ONC in the winter, um, but there been have you know really good participation in connectathons at HL7. Uh, the very first one was in January. Um, you know, uh, gosh, I want to say there was at least 20 folks that participated, and then again in May. Uh, and the idea is throughout the summer to kind of refine the specification with a pretty solid draft published uh, later this year. Uh, ultimately, I think this is one of those projects that will have enough momentum that uh, it will go to ballot at HL7, so it may become an official standard. But if you are planning to request bulk data or are going to have to serve up it, uh, this September would be a good time to get plugged into that group uh, if you want to provide uh, your input. And there's a link to each of the projects at the bottom when, these, uh, when you download these slides. Uh, clinical notes, uh, we launched kind of end of March, and uh, we launched with the kind of common clinical notes set in hand. Um, we did do a little bit of pre-work uh, because in FHIR there is not a kind of way to do clinical notes. And so uh, in January, I talked to every person I could think of at the Connectathon to say, how would you do clinical notes? Because it's just that, you know, you get really curious about a problem. And, um, so we had a little bit of a little bit of work prior to May, and right now we're focused on using the document reference resource to access clinical notes. Um, and I'll talk more about a little well, I'll talk a little bit more about US Core and the data query profiles this afternoon, and I'll spend a little bit of time on clinical notes on why we uh, selected that. Uh, but right now we, we've had a few you know we've had a few conference calls. Uh, we'll continue to kind of this summer do a little bit of testing, um, and you know, I think our big thing is we need some more examples. But ultimately the big kind of uh, place for input is going to be the September Connectathon. Uh, so for folks who are going to be uh, who've never been to HL7 or have never been to a Connectathon, it's going to be in Baltimore. It's fairly low cost to join, but that'd be a great time to provide your input. And Connectathons are one of these funny things that um, we do our best to uh, have working. You know, it's it's not uh, you know some folks do show up with no working code, but it's very helpful to have done some pre-work. Uh, and uh, we you know we learned. Uh, a lot of good things at the May Connectathon, and I expect we'll learn more uh, in September. Uh, and questionnaire, questionnaire response. Uh, we kicked off in April. Uh, we have tried to locate some simple questionnaires, um, and with the idea that our first step is can an EHR retrieve it and display it, and then potentially just return a questionnaire response. Uh, one of the things that's a little tricky about questionnaires is sometimes the questions that are asked would map very nicely to fire resources instead of a questionnaire response, which then makes it infinitely more useful. Um, but uh, it's a little tricky, um, you know, how we do that mapping, it's kind of per questionnaire, and right now we're really focused on, you know, what does that exchange and rendering uh, look like? Um, so we'll see. Uh, we're hoping to do a kind of miniature virtual connectathon in July, uh, which will be really simple, retrieve, display, and spit out a questionnaire response. But ultimately, again, we're kind of charging to uh, the uh, September uh, working group uh, at HL7. Okay, so those are the new, you know, if you've gotten a background on the old initiatives and, and new ones. Um, so we want participation, so especially client developers. Uh, we have a fair number of uh, servers, but we, of course, take more of those. Um, but just to step back, you know, what, what is, I think folks hear the name Argonaut, and it's, oh, I, I'm following, even seeing Apple, you know, we, we, we follow Argonaut. And, and what really is Argonaut? And I think the key thing is, 
It's an engagement of the community. Um, I started to put names of vendors and myself on here, but then I decided that was probably wildly inappropriate because what people would infer from that. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a, uh, a mix of folks kind of coming together to talk through how we're going to solve the problem to try to provide a baseline consistency across the industry. I do think one thing that uh, you know, some folks will, and client apps may look at the Argonaut profiles and say they don't do enough. You know, if you look at uh, allergy, it requires like four elements. Okay, and I would say, yeah, you know, we probably could require a few more. But our 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 kind of approach has been let's set a floor. Let's make sure we try to get everybody to um, you know support these four things consistently, and then over time we can layer more things in. But let's make sure we're starting at the same place. So the first thing, you know, is engage the community. Um, I don't know why I picked Sesame Street. I guess I have kids. Um, you know, play together. If you look, you know, everyone in this picture has their own musical instrument. Um, some are sophisticated and some are simple. And the idea is we learn a lot by playing, uh, you know, together and, and doing some testing. And I originally had like a, you know, design, test, you know, build loop up here. And I thought that was too boring. And so this is, uh, yeah. Play together, but you get the idea. Of, you know, we propose a solid design, we do some testing, and we iterate as fast as we can. And uh, the testing part of it and the playing part of it is actually where I think the most learning comes from. Um, so that's the, the argonaut is you know form your form your community and play together. And I guess one of the things that comes up sometimes is can argonaut take on more projects? Like you guys have been successful, you know. Could you do five projects? Could we hire more people? Like, what could we do? And what we're finding working with the vendors is. The vendors have limited development resources too, and you know they're actually the key piece of this puzzle. Is if they're not participating, in giving feedback, the specs actually aren't very good. Um, not saying that we can't write good specs. Uh, yeah, it just it, they're really dependent on on good feedback. So, just to wrap up, so please connect with current projects uh, for folks who aren't on you know on Zulip. Check out Bulk Data and Argonaut for the other two. And uh, in terms of we have the upcoming Connectathon, and and you know reach out uh, to to any one of us. Um, and that's a wrap. So thank you, and that's our night. Yeah, I, actually, I will take some questions. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, so the question is is on some of our uh, uh, projects that were you know we said hey it was it was a real challenge to get uh, to an endpoint what you know what, where do those projects live now uh, you know for provider directory uh, once care quality said hey we're it's good enough for us to use we said all right we're we know we're good and I think for the other ones um, I think scheduling uh, I think once we've gotten through the pilot and uh, kind of run the course of a year and have a published specification that someone could pick up and use, um, that we, you know, we've called that success. Um, I think some of these could run for years and years and years, and just you know, putting the point of a few folks implementing it has been, all right, that's good enough. So it's a good question. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so I'm new to all of this. Yeah. Yeah. So the question on is a lot of the use cases that we've done are all about uh, provider and clinical access and, and you know, what's being done for payers. Uh, there is, uh, in terms of Argonauts, you know, we haven't had any initiatives focused directly on payer uh, use cases. I think it's definitely something we'd consider in the future. There is a separate project that's spun up similar to Argonaut called the Da Vinci Project. And there are a few, yeah, of course. So there are a few people here that are working on that. I just saw someone wave at me. Um, yeah, that would be willing to fill you in on that. And there's actually a talk on that, I think, later today or tomorrow. Is it tomorrow? Tomorrow on Da Vinci. So that'd be one to, that'd be one to check out. Um, any, oh, any other questions? All right, we're set. Thank you.